I want to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, there are very many, there are several familiar faces in the crowd, and it's always good to see that. And there's some new faces as well. Um, so i just introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Rich Arstead. I am the senior manuscript archivist for the Montana Historical Society, so I work in the basement. And it's a, it's a rare treat for me to get out of the basement and onto the first floor, so I'm very pleased to be here tonight. <laughs> um, I even get to see the stars very well. Seldom do I get to see the sunshine, but it's nice to see the stars, and it's nice to see so many other faces because, you know, we don't get a lot of visitors in the basement either. So not even Kirby comes down from up on high, or Becca, uh, to the basement. Anthony does, so we, we get to see his smiling face. I've been at the Historical yeah. Society for almost 15 years now, and it's been an incredible privilege to work here. Um, the people that work at this place are just absolutely amazing in what they do and the knowledge that they have and to be a part of that is, is truly special. Uh, to be from Montana and work at the Montana Historical Society and be able to work with history is also a, one of those blessings that you just shake your head in wonderment sometimes that you, you, you can't believe that it happened to you. So it is indeed my pleasure to be here. It's indeed my pleasure to be presenting to you tonight. I hope you find the topic as engaging as I do. The Indelible Mark of Francis M. Thompson, Montana's premier tenderfoot. Uh, Thompson is an extremely interesting individual. And uh, my introduction to him, like my introduction to a lot of the characters at the Historical Society, is through the archives, of course, because that's where I work. And the interesting thing about it is my office is in the basement, but just on the other side of my second office door are all these wonderful collections of the Montana Historical Society. Records from Francis Thompson, from Wilbur Fisk Sanders, Sidney Edgerton, uh, um, T.C. Powers, uh, the Anaconda Company, Montana State Government, all the way back to the territorial days. And so if you listen really closely, you can hear a lot of murmuring going on in that back room as these boxes are all talking to one another. And occasionally, um, you know, you can, get, you can strike up your own conversation with them. And I think that's one of the things that I love the most is because once you spend a little time getting to know some of these individuals, even though they've been gone for a century, they actually feel like friends. And occasionally my wife has looked at me strangely and says, who is Mary Frances Benton Connor? And it's like, oh, well, um, she's a 54-year-old school teacher from up in Hill County. <laughs> so you do get to become acquainted with them. Um, you catch yourself calling them by their first name uh, because they're pals. Um, they talk to you, you talk to them. And uh, that's what makes it great. And that's how I got introduced to Francis Thompson. He, he spoke to me, and, and we, we've had several lengthy discussions since that time. And they've been pretty interesting. <laughs> now, the nice thing about the collections is you have the actual physical records to go through. You have their writings and, and so forth. And so you get an idea of the person based on how they write. You can see if there's a sense of humor there and things like that. And as I was going through the collections and getting ready to do this presentation, I, I realized that we had somebody else in the basement outside my office who knew Francis Thompson extremely well. They were very, very good friends, as a matter of fact. And so I thought, well, what better way to find out more about Francis Thompson than to talk to the, his good friend. And so I invited him out of the box to come speak to me. And it, that's all it takes is an invitation. These folks are more than willing to talk to you any time that you're ready to listen, Tuesday through Friday, 9 to 5. And so the individual that I invited uh, to have a conversation with me was uh, Wilbur Fiss Sanders. Now, for those of you who know Wilbur Fiss Sanders, he never did anything by half measures. Uh, as such, when I invited him to chat with me about his good friend Frank Thompson, Colonel Sanders determined that the best way to do that was not just through his letters. And although he couldn't appear perhaps in a quite solid state, that maybe in a slightly transparent way, he could be part of the presentation. And when I told him that I was working on this presentation, well, he immediately <laughs> volunteered his services to speak to the crowd. In fact, he insisted that, it w that uh, he was the one and only obvious choice uh, to speak concisely, accurately, and great length uh, about his good friend, Frank Thompson. After more than a bit of debate, 
uh, some cajoling and one or two threats that I would put him back in the box if he made me, I told him that uh, I would give him 10 to 15 minutes uh, to uh, provide a, a, a brief overview or introduction to, to tonight's topic. So to kick off tonight's presentation, Colonel Senator Wilbur Fisk Sanders. Likeness. Greetings and good evening. Please allow me to introduce myself. I am uh, Wilbur Fisk Sanders. I practiced the law in Montana for several decades since uh, arriving here in 1863. Um, some even say that I am a jurist of exceptional talents. Uh, occasionally I find it hard to argue with such a claim. I am here tonight to reflect on the early times of our settlement in Montana and to assist others in introducing you to an old friend of those times and places. Uh, when, I asked, uh, when I was asked to come out of my box, so to say, I thought that in order to share with you anything about my friend Frank Thompson and the times we lived through in early Montana, that I must impress upon you how different were those times, or those early days. Fortunately, I, I found something I wrote back in the 1880s in my papers uh, that communicates this fact. So let me share that with you. And how long do I have? T 10 to 15 minutes, Senator. Well, you know, normally in, in, the, in the courtroom, we just go as long as we need to go to make our point. I, I understand, I, but given the amount of energy that you're expending to be here in our presence, I just want to warn you, you that you, you, ask will, a lot. you will return to the box promptly at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Let me begin. A portion of our history has been separated from our lives, is bound up by itself and contrasts strangely with all our existing conditions. We look back to it as something unique. It seems wholly like, not unlike a dream. Without, with difficulty, we convince ourselves that we were a part and parcel of it. And we wonder that we existed with such strange surroundings that did not appreciate their present significance nor how suddenly and absolutely they were to pass away. The period which separates uh, that earlier life from the struggles and toils of this is the advent into the territory of railroad connection. Uh, so much changed with the coming of the railroad. Uh, we no longer go to the stage offices when the coaches do, with the ex expectation that possibly a strange face or an old familiar one may greet us when the coach arrives. We do not wait a week or a month for the advent of a mail from the states. We cannot keep track of the great enterprises that grow up just beyond the line of our vision as we did in days that are gone by. No grist mill, sawmill, or quartz mill uh, could be erected in any part of the territory in the former time without a knowledge of it going to the fireside of every uh, intelligent citizen. The names of the inhabitants of the remotest towns were quite familiar to our ears. No stranger could come within our gates whose business the community would not soon know. Hospitality and curiosity alike stood on tiptoe to welcome and interrogate every newcomer. Our citizens were advised at what time in the year the mountain ranges would forbid the ingress or egress of merchandise. The advent of winter isolated us from other communities. and We had six months before us during which period there was little obtrusion to disturb the conditions which we ourselves made. The environments of our existence were such that winter did not bring with it uh, that opportunity for labor that we now have. And our people, were, for a considerable period of the year, indulged in leisure, which now they do not know. All this has changed so suddenly that we do hardly know when it occurred. We do hardly know when it occurred. Prior to the advent of the newspapers, the neighborhood news of every character was distributed through the community at favorite points of rendezvous in the various settlements of the territory. I recall as coming under my observation a number of the stores where the citizens used to gather and uh, talk over events occurring in the neighborhood or discussing propositions that concerned a wider area. Uh, the, to nearly the, clo the close of this period, there was scarce a hotel in the territory. The saloons were plenty, but their character was not such as to encourage the gatherings I have mentioned. And so the people used to congregate in certain mercantile establishments. Of course, these audiences were composed wholly of men, or males. The number of ladies in the territory was very limited. And of considerable number 
of mercantile establishments, only a few furnish the comforts and conveniences for such gatherings, uh, for such gatherings or manifested the hospitality which invited them. At Bannock, the place of all others where the better class of citizens used to assemble with some of the worst class, it must be confessed, uh, was the store of Mr. Char Mr. George Crispin. His ample fireplace in the room back of the store, always blazing in the winter with a hospitable fire and surrounded by stools and benches for the accommodations of visitors. Good. Colonel Sanders, if I, if I may interrupt. <sighs> We, we if you do, must. We, we do have a time limit here, and, and the presentation tonight is about your good friend Frank Thompson, and we've heard very little about uh, Mr. Thompson to this point. Uh, well, Frank Thompson operated one of these stores, of which I speak. He did. Uh, <laughs> and Paris Fouts had another, and General George P. Doris, and later in the winter, King and Gillette, and John J. Rowe and company. Uh, these places with uh, some others were noted for their hospitality and easy grace with which um, all who desired to come were entertained. Moving on, uh, it, it was at the peak of the Civil War uncertainties that we did arrive in Bannock in 1863, some before us, Frank Thompson being one arriving in 1862. Uh, the communities would occasionally, were occasionally startled by wild rumors of the war, uh, which being eagerly caught up and traced their ultimate source were fathered upon what was facetiously known during that winter as Dr. Glick's Grapevine Telegraph. Uh, we had Washington captured several times and Mr. Lincoln a prisoner in the hands of the Confederates. Uh, although the truth to tell, uh, there was considerable bad blood extant uh, concerning the war about which the communities radically differed. Uh, during this period, news would come from various regions of new discoveries of mines. There was not, uh, not thought of any other industry in the country. To find mines, to plant mine, mining communities, and to supply them was then supposed to be the extent of the industries which would, would occupy the attention of everybody who should thereafter occupy Montana. There were a number of people living in the country uh, who within a short period thereafter left the territory and whose names cannot therefore uh, to any considerable extent be identified with the history of the territory. Um, in Bannock, I recall Dr. Uh, Garrett, I believe from Maryland, uh, who impressed me as being a man of considerable ability, a gentleman in his demeanor and a good citizen, whose subsequent career I know nothing of. Uh, Mr. E.R. Purple was also a resident of Bannock, who left the territory in 1863 or 4 and never returned. He was an invalid in search of health, a man of gentle manners, kind heart, uh, and of very considerable literary skills, uh, who returned to the city of New York and resided there for nearly a dozen years before he died. He maintained through all that period a very sincere and ardent affection for Montana and Montanians. George Chrisman, of whom I have already spoken, was a man of kindly disposition, a liberal and public-spirited citizen. He left Montana for New York State and finally died in the pursuit of gold off the coast of South America. The names of persons of this class who left Montana in 1864 and who are worthy of some mention in her annals should be much amplified. There was another class of people, Frank Thompson being one, uh, here in Montana in that early time who remained somewhat longer in the territory and in one form or another identified themselves with the history of Montana who are also entitled to a considered memory. Among these, Gaylord G. Bissell is one man of excellent sense, of a good education, a member of the medical profession, but lured by prospects of gain to follow mining instead. Uh, there was also Harrison Gray Otis, the Reverend A.M. Torbert, uh, Robert M. Hageman, and Joseph uh, Swift, Jr., uh, at one time superintendent of the Diamond Match Company in New York. Uh, the Reverend Jonathan Blanchard, a very able and venerable doctor of divinity, who came to Montana and spent a summer uh, and went on to Wheaton College in Illinois. Uh, there was also William C. Ream, who was elected from Bannock to the Legislative Assembly of Idaho Territory in the fall of 1863, who, going to Lewiston, Idaho, discharged faithfully his duties as a representative, but returned to his native state of Pennsylvania not long afterward. Colonel Sanders, I, again, the, the time flies, sir, and in, 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 in a little over an hour, you will be returning to the box, and so if you could 
I, I know you have this well-prepared speech that you work long and hard on, but if you could kind of maybe step it up just a little bit. I prepared this uh, 130 years ago at least. <laughs> it deserves more time. Well, I'll give say, you a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should get to my friend Frank Thompson. You are correct. He is Let's the man see of what the I hour have. today. Frank Thompson. I, I, will, I will speak about Frank Thompson. There are many, many people who deserve recognition and, and uh, our, our memories, so that point has been made. Uh, Frank Thompson, uh, we had a couple things in common in our early life, uh, both coming from uh, good New England families, although I, I did grow up in western New York, but uh, my family was from uh, New England stock as well. Um, we both taught school uh, ever so briefly, yet long enough to discover that we never since had any desire to teach school. <laughs> uh, some things we didn't have in common, perhaps. Uh, Frank was a teetotaler. He was a churchgoer uh, when opportunity allowed. Um, my father uh, did, did have us attend church, and, and I have been known occasionally, but, but Frank was a churchgoer when, whenever he was able. Um, and, oh, a, a great choir leader in Bannock. Uh, there were not many who could match the dulcet tones of Frank Thompson. Uh, he, he, uh, in his early adulthood, he developed an expertise in the banking business, uh, traveling throughout the Middle Western states uh, for his company, which was based in Cincinnati, Ohio, another Ohioan uh, for a time, as myself. Um, he, he developed this expertise and was uh, in, in high demand, eventually ending up in St. Louis with his, uh, his brother, I believe, um, as the, the war of the rebellion broke out, he, um, he didn't see the military uh, life as something he wanted to pursue. He was, um, it just had a negative connotation uh, through his experiences. But uh, he, he turned down commissions to join the Union Army. He, he left, went to St. Louis, um, preparing to uh, join a business venture to, brand new, uh, to, to go up to the brand new gold discoveries in what at that point was Washington territory um, with a company of men and many investors behind him. By uh, May of 1862, they left for Fort Benton uh, up the Missouri River to the, the Dakota Territory, um, to the mining areas of which I spoke, and uh, soon, what would soon become Montana. You know, I, I tell you, those, the boys of 1863, 64 uh, are missing. Uh, from, from my experience, from, uh, from all that I know, uh, no man came to Montana and, and stayed so short a time, uh, left so deep an impress on history as did Frank Thompson. And uh, it is a pleasure to know in a rude time, the influence was wholly wholesome. Thank you very much, Colonel Sanders. I, I appreciate your introduction. Mm. I'm, I'm sure you find it a relief to sit down. I mean, it's, it's been a while since you've been vertical, so. Mm. Uh, moving on with the presentation uh, and the wonderful introduction by Colonel Sanders, uh, my part of the presentation is going to be not as fluid, uh, perhaps not quite as lengthy, um, and, and probably not quite as detailed as uh, Colonel Sanders was. And uh, even though we do appreciate his efforts, I could hear him nervously pacing up and down the stacks of the archives as he was preparing this. Even though he might have written it in the 1880s, he, he is a, uh, he's an irreverent editor of his own material. <laughs> May I have a rebuttal? <laughs> When would you not? <laughs> I, I may just stand up at any moment and ask the members of the jury here to indulge me. But. I, that, I would remind you, Senator, that this, is, this isn't a jury. This is, this is a presentation. And so it's, it's kind of a festive evening as oh. opposed to some type of judicial. Well, allow me the you know, imagination to I realize pretend. that sometimes things are It's fine. been a long time. It has been a long time. <laughs> You, for, you forget that I, I, I'm the one that dusted you off and 
out of the box. Thank so, you, sir. Yes. Okay. Frank Thompson. All right, Frank Thompson. Yes, you're right. <laughs> now I digress. Um, so um, we have Thompson arriving in Fort Benton. And, you know, one of the things that uh, is just absolutely phenomenal about Frank Thompson is he wrote about his experiences when he came to Montana. And despite the fact that he spent such a short time here, you could tell that he really enjoyed every minute that he was here. And he had a fascination and a passion for Montana that would last his entire life. Um, despite the fact that he didn't live here but a brief time, Montana was never far from his mind, never far from his memories. And so there's this wonderful book uh, that he put together um, before his passing and after the passing of Colonel Sanders about uh, his time spent here in Montana. And um, when I read this book, one of the things that immediately struck me was his sense of humor. And I, I don't think anything portrays that better than um, the uh, events that occurred with one of Montana's most tragic romances. And that's the, the courtship and marriage of Electra Bryan to Henry Plummer, the arch villain of Montana territory. Uh, our, our original angel and the bad man, for those of you who are John Wayne fans. Um, <coughs> they met at Sun River Crossing at the government farm there that Electa's sister and fa uh, brother-in-law were operating. Uh, Jonathan Swift, or Joseph Swift, the uh, gentleman portrayed here, uh, served as the best man uh, for Plummer's wedding, and in fact was so attached to Plummer, he was one of the few individuals, perhaps the only individual, who believed in Plummer's innocence uh, when the vigilantes came to get him. But I love this passage uh, from Thompson uh, about the wedding. On the 20th of June, 1863, at Sun River, Henry Plummer and Miss Electa, Electa O'Brien were married by Reverend Father Minotieri of the Mission of St. Peter, where Mr. Swift, acting as best man, and for the only time in my life, I acted as bridesmaid. <laughs> The happy couple immediately left the farm in the government ambulance to which were attached four green Indian ponies. Now, being a bridesmaid, I can understand where that might be unusual. But the tidbit about the four green Indian ponies, that's kind of interesting too that he would include that. So they must have started out with kind of a bumpy ride according, uh, you know, if you read a little bit into this. The interesting thing is, is that um, Thompson knew the Vale fam family and Electa prior to Henry Plummer's arrival. And so when Thompson came back from his trip uh, to California, back to Montana, Mrs. Vale asked him to speak to Electa and convince her not to rush into marriage with Thompson, or with uh, Plummer. So not knowing the individual, you know, Thompson agreed that he would speak to the young lady and see if he could maybe slow the romance down a little bit, just cool it off some and let you feel, you know, folks could think about things a little bit. So he had a, a fairly long conversation with Electa and thought that he had convinced her that perhaps she was moving a little too quickly because the year before, Plummer and a gentleman by the name of Cleveland had showed up at Sun River Crossing and they had both taken a shine to Miss Electa. Um, then they went south uh, and uh, down to the gold fields around Bannock and Grasshopper Creek, at which point um, Cleveland and Plummer had a falling out and Plummer killed Cleveland and then he came back for the fair electa. <laughs> so Thompson reminded her of that fact and she, she agreed that perhaps slowing things down was a good thing to do. However, as soon as her, uh, as soon as her bow showed up across the river and shouted his presence, she was in love once again and nothing could forestall their marriage. And so the happy couple headed for the gold fields at Bannock um, in an army ambulance attached to four green ponies, Indian ponies. And uh, you have that kind of first introduction of Thompson and his sense of humor as he relates the events that occurred in Montana. Now, as Colonel Sanders mentioned, um, and Sanders had, or excuse me, Thompson had his uh, hands in everything. What you see here, um, the map is a sketch map that, that Thompson did in 1864 of uh, of Bannock. And you can actually see the divisions within the community reflect the divisions that were in the country at the same time. You'll see in the upper corner where it says Yankee Flat and then you'll see the rest of Bannock and in the middle right here is the home of Judge 
Sidney Edgerton. At this time, he's not the territorial governor yet. But you see the political division within the community of Bannock already. And uh, Senator Sanders already referred to it, what it was like for those individuals that were coming to the territory. Uh, Samuel Word, who was a young man that came to Montana about the same time as Thompson and Sanders, I think described it best when he wrote, the country was sparsely populated by people from all parts of the Union, many from different states who did not care to enter the armies on either side, some few who had a taste of war in one army or the other. After their term of enlistment expired, came here to get away from the confusion and hard times incident to a state of war and to better their fortunes. They had become generally tired of politics and seemed contented to be where they could engage in lucrative employment, free from the turmoil of political excitement of communities involved in rebellion. The acquisition of, the goal, uh, the acquisition of gold was the prevailing excitement. And so you have all these restless young men coming to the territory. And again, political loyalties are divided. Um, you see next to the map, uh, kind of the first rough laws for the mining camp that were put together. Uh, with gold strikes, you had this kind of interesting influx of population um, for Montana. You, you had those who were traveling from the gold fields of California and Nevada into the territory. And then you had those who were coming from the states. Some of them come from the northern states, some of them came from the border states or the southern states. And so they kind of just ended up in, um, in uh, the Bannock, Virginia, Virginia City area. But they understood that there had to be some type of law, rule of law, that would make sure that their mining claims and so forth stood up in court. And so what they did was they drew up these mining, miners' laws and so forth, most of them um, provisions and, and things like that, that they were pulled from the laws that were established in California and Nevada prior to the Montana strikes, so that there was some rough form of governance in terms of the mining claims and who owned, owned what. And Thompson was, was a part of that, a part of the mix. Imagine the excitement this young man must have felt coming into this territory um, to be young and, 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 and living that type of adventure. And, and again, it comes through in his writings uh, in, in the book when he talks about that. Um, despite their attempt to get away from the violence of war, they could not escape violence completely. Um, with the gold strikes uh, and the acquisition of large um, amounts of wealth and so forth, a, a, uh, a group of uh, bandits uh, struck in the area and started robbing individuals. There were a number of murders and so forth. And so a vigilance committee was formed. Uh, you see there Captain James Williams, who was the leader of the vigilantes. Uh, Wilbur Fisk Sanders, the esteemed senator sitting here, was the prosecuting attorney. And then you have ex Beadler, who was one of those individuals who was not afraid to do his duty. Um, Frank Thompson is an interesting witness to these events. Uh, he didn't participate as one of the vigilantes. He was not one of the signers of the vigilante oath. Um, he had a very close relationship with uh, Henry Plummer. He also had a close relationship with a number of um, Plummer's Confederates who came west with Thompson. As a matter of fact, the joke was that Thompson came west um, the year uh, before Henry Plummer did with most of the bandits who would who would be robbing and killing in, in, uh, in uh, southwestern Montana at that time. So he, he had allegiances in both camps, if you will. Um, and being an honest individual, I think he knew pretty much what was going on. Uh, the vigilantes weren't afraid to talk to him about things that were going on. And uh, to the extent that, um, that uh, he actually knew ahead of time that uh, his friend Henry Plummer was in danger. In fact, Thompson and Plummer both were staying at the home of uh, the Vales, who had left the government farm at Sun River Crossing and came to Bannock. And so they were both boarding with the Vales. And uh, Henry Plummer's wife had left <coughs> a few weeks before and had gone to Iowa. There was some suspicion about exactly what caused that. Um, but the night before the vigilantes decided to deal with Henry Plummer, one of them told Thompson what was going to occur. Thompson went home that night, spoke to Henry, spoke to the Vale family, went to bed, got up the next morning, 
knowing exactly what was going to happen, so he wasn't surprised when the vigilantes knocked on the door of the Vale home and asked for Henry Plummer to come out. And, of course, you all know the story of Henry Plummer being, being hanged by the vigilantes uh, in Virginia City, but perhaps something that isn't quite as well known is um, Henry, uh, Frank Thompson's uh, involvement with that. Like I said, he didn't participate in the actions of the vigilantes. He was Plummer's friend. So when Plummer was hung, obviously somebody had to settle the estate. And so Thompson volunteered to be the executor for Henry Plummer's estate. And what you'll see here is the receipt um, that was given to Thompson, um, stating that Thompson would pay for the construction of a coffin and the burial of, his, of uh, Henry Plummer, which Thompson did. Um, and then in settling the rest of the counts, uh, Thompson took what was left of the money and he sent it to Henry Plummer's wife, Electa, in Iowa. Although he does state that he never did hear from her if she received it, he assumed that she did. And he moved on. Um, he did worry about his association and friendship with Henry Plummer and some of Henry Plummer's uh, uh, friends and that it, it had tarnished his reputation. Um, to some extent, and so he was, he did have some trepidation about that relationship. And there's this great passage uh, in his book where he writes about it. After this terrible bloody period had passed and some newcomer came into Bannock and made inquiry concerning the times and the road agents, Judge Edgerton was wont to clap me on the shoulder and say, Thompson's the only one left of the gang. So he was somewhat nervous about that. He did talk to, uh, he did talk to uh, Colonel Sanders and, and uh, Judge Edgerton um, if he needed to do something to prove that he was, he was a good citizen and both individuals assured him that he was, his character was unblemished um, despite his relationship with Henry Plummer. So he was, he was extremely happy about that. Um, so Thompson's involved with the, um, on the periphery of the vigilante movement. He's involved with a lot of things. Uh, including the creation of the territory of Montana. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a graphic that I put together a while ago that kind of shows you the various um, gold strikes that occurred in Montana at about the same time these major battles were taking place back east during the Civil War. So it gives you an idea of the types of individuals who were coming to Montana. It gives you an idea of how Montana was essentially knocked off of the front page of the newspapers back east. Because despite the richness of the gold strikes here in Montana, nothing could outweigh the death toll that was occurring on the fields of battle at Gettysburg and Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, Antietam, Cold Harbor, and some of these other places. Um, they quickly determined that, uh, that uh, the eastern portion of Idaho Territory, Bannock, Virginia City, all, those, all that territory east of the mountains, probably should be a territory of its own. And so in the winter of 1864, in January, um, they decided, a number of men got together and decided that they should go to Washington, D.C. and advocate, uh, advocate for the uh, creation of Montana territory, so which they did. And most of us are familiar with the story of Sidney Edgerton sewing, you know, great big ingots of gold into his jacket, you know, and clanking to Washington, D.C. to, inform Congress of the riches of the, the riches of this new territory and why they should make it a territory unto itself. But Frank Thompson was one of those individuals who went east as well. Um, he was engaged in actively lobbying those individuals that he knew in, in Congress and using his connections to try to get the territory created. So Thompson was there, Sidney Edgerton was there. Um, Nathaniel Langford, who was a Democrat, was there advocating for the creation of the territory, as was Samuel T. Hauser, also a staunch, uh, a staunch Democrat and, and uh, a citizen of uh, Missouri, a former citizen of Missouri. Uh, Hauser um, and Langford were uh, two of the individuals who were actually pushing for the appointment of Edgerton as governor of the new territory. Um, Hauser had his eye on being the territorial secretary. But considering the makeup of Congress at this time in the war, um, he was it was decided that he was probably not a good candidate for that position. So it didn't work out quite as well for him as it did Edgerton. 
that these individuals brought with them petitions from the territory saying that the people here trusted Sidney Edgerton to be their territorial governor. And these, these were petitions that were signed by Democrats and Republicans alike. And at this point, nobody really saw, although you saw the divisions within the community itself and the map, nobody saw the political divisions and how they might affect the creation of a new territory. That would come um, a bit later. Uh, as uh, they, they started to form the government. And once again, Thompson played a role because he ran for the position of councilman from Beaverhead County, uh, a position that he actually won during that election. And so the, the first territorial legislature of Montana was held in Bannock. Uh, and according to this photograph, this, was the, this building was the place where they had the first session. So you, could, you can kind of see why they might have went a little mad um, being cooped up in there, it makes my, makes my basement office look pretty plush. <laughs> <laughs> so the first territorial legislative session took place in Bannock, and the gentleman that, that um, they all selected to be their territorial governor, all of a sudden discovered his Republican roots. Sidney Edgerton was a founding member of the Republican Party, he was an abolitionist. He'd served two terms. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Colonel Sanders. Yes, he'd served two terms in Congress as a representative mm -hmm. from Ohio. Um, he carried a bill for the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C., if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. And interesting enough, he was asked to be the executor of the estate of John Brown as well. He did. Um, so Edgerton was heavily engaged in what was going on back east in the war effort and um, very much on the side of the abolitionists and very much on the side of the Republican Party. Well, one of the issues at hand was in order to serve in the legislature, you had to take the ironclad oath. Now, the oath was an interesting piece of uh, legislation. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was not a fan of it, and in fact, he tried to veto it. Um, but the Republicans in Congress overrode his veto. He believed that the ironclad oath was too stringent and if they relied on the oath all of those who fought for the confederacy could never be welcomed back into the union as full citizens and so he, for him it, it didn't work edgerton insisted that uh, that they were going to that the Mon montana legislators were going to uh, to take the oath um, stand up and swear to it and also sign the oath and so that's what you see right here is is uh, is the oath, uh, the ironclad oath. And you'll see Frank Thompson's signature down here. And once again, he's, he's got an interesting narrative about um, the uh, taking of the oath for the council members. And again, remember, Montana is, is, they're united in their desire for a territory that they can call their own. They're divided along the lines of <laughs> politics and the war. And so Edgerton was very firm in his belief that if you were not a member of the Republican Party, then you were a member of the party that was trying to tear the country apart, the Democrats. So the Democrats and the Republicans did not get along. The, the first legislative session was split um, almost exactly in half. There was a one-member delegate um, majority in the House for the Democrats and a one-member majority uh, for the Republicans in the council. So it was a pretty evenly divided uh, legislature. But this is what Thompson writes about, uh, about taking the ironclad oath. The war of, of the rebellion was at its height, and party feeling was rampant. The ironclad oath required of the members excluded all those who had served in Confederate armies. Um, and to, to the extent that one John H. Rogers, who was elected to the House for Madison County and served as an officer, uh, could not take his uh, seat because he couldn't take the prescribed oath. When the members elect of the council were drawn up to take the oath, Charles S. Bagg, a member of the Ma of Mem uh, excuse me, a member from Madison County, an intense Southern sympathizer, happened to stand at one end of the line and I at the other. As the governor repeated the solemn words of the prescribed oath, Major Bagg interspersed words of contempt. That means obey Abe Lincoln. I guess not. Keeping silence as long as I could, at last I said, Governor, I move that we proceed to take the oath prescribed by law without further interference. Major Bagg immediately stepped over and stood close to me. 
and the governor again read the oath with no more interruptions. I expected that at its close the major would attack me, but he said, Dr. Thompson, I'll make you the best friend I have before the winter is over. I retorted, I am your friend now. When you're sober, Major Bag, you are a gentleman. When you are drunk, you are an infernal nuisance. After that, we were good friends. He was a good citizen, an able man, a good lawyer, and I overcame, and, and I hope he overcame his great failing. So, coupled with the book and the reading and so forth, it gives you an opportunity to look at the signature page, and I put this up for a reason. This is Charles Bag's signature. So perhaps he did have a bit of the tremors when uh, the oath was being prescribed because uh, it's the only one that's not legible. <laughs> Obviously, he was having a little bit of a problem uh, handling the, uh, the ink pen at that time. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, narrative. In association with that, one of uh, Thompson's fellow councilmen, uh, Erasmus D. Levitt, was so incensed by Bagg's action and the controversy over John Rogers and whether or not he was going to take his seat um, in the House, that he crafted this council joint resolution in reference to the war. And essentially what it says is, is that Montana and the citizens of Montana are going to support the Union. But what I found was interesting as I was reading this pledge, there was a small section within it that had quotes around. And I read it and I thought, well, that kind of sounds familiar. And so I did what all good researchers do. I Googled it. And uh, what I discovered is, is that it was a slightly different paraphrase of George Washington, of a segment of George Washington's farewell address. So what we have in the council joint resolution is the statement, we hereby renew our pledges ever, in, ever entertained of loyalty to the union and will ever frown indignantly upon any attempt to alienate our portion of our common country from another. And then what we have from President Washington at his farewell address after his second term, and indignantly frowning upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest or to enfeeble the sacred ties which now link together the various parts. So what they're talking about is the sectionalism that divided the country and helped spark the Civil War. What they're talking about is party politics and how both sides became so polarized that they couldn't talk to one another and they couldn't govern any longer. And so the only recourse that they thought they had was to start shooting at one another. And it was like one of those light bulb moments in, in my head, and it probably shouldn't have been. But these were extremely well-educated individuals. Dr. Levitt knew and was familiar with Washington's farewell address in 1864. And he brought it to light in Montana in this council joint resolution. How cool is that? <laughs> this is pretty awesome stuff. Um, so things start out a little tense for that first legislative session. You've got the ironclad oath, you've got the council joint resolution. Interesting enough, this thing skates through both the council and the house with one, only one no vote. Charles S. Bagg, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and I love the fact that Bagg is considered a southern sympathizer, a, a rampant southern sympathizer, and he's from New York. <laughs> um, so the business went on of creating the territory, fashioning laws for for Montana, creating the counties and things like that, and Thompson had a hand on that. But there were some, there were some key pieces of legislation that he carried that I, I, I just want to mention um, tonight. And one of them is Council Bill 15, which created your Montana Historical Society, which is pretty amazing. In 1864, they decide that the territory needs a historical society in order to preserve the history of this area. And Thompson carried the bill. You'll see uh, up there depicted a number of uh, the early members of the Historical Society. Uh, Colonel Sanders, of course, uh, was heavily involved in the Historical Society and was at one time, his law offices were the repository of the collection of the Historical Society. Not the best idea, ultimately. N no, the fire did create a little bit of 
an issue, but I must say, sir, that you did act very quickly in, in, in reconstituting the collections to the best of your ability, and so we are the beneficiaries of, of, of your diligent work. Thank you, sir. In that, in that regard. But you'll also see Granville Stewart up there, his brother James, and Hezekiah Hosmer, who looks like he could scare the bark off of a tree. <laughs> Um, but these were the these were the <laughs> these were the creators of the of the of the Montana Historical Society, and, and this is the bill. Uh, interesting enough, it is the only council bill in that legislative session that's signed by the governor. And you can see Sidney Edgerton's signature at the bottom of the page. All the other council bills, I think we're only missing one, and it's Council Bill One. It'd be interesting to find out which that which one that was. Um, but this is the only one that's signed. And so it makes it unique for a number of reasons. For one, it created us. For another, it's signed by the governor. And, uh, and uh, it's the only one signed by the governor. So to have the foresight to do that, so that 150 years later, we could be here tonight enjoying the collections of the Montana Historical Society that started way back in uh, February of 1865. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Another bill that uh, Thompson carried uh, was for the establishment of the common school system in the territory. Uh, this was something that was, well, pardon the pun, but common uh, at this time for Republicans to promote free education. Um, uh, and uh, so Thompson was an advocate of that. He carried Council Bill 38 to that purpose. Um, to, be it enacted by the Legislative Assembly of the Territory of Montana as follows, that the principle of all money accrued to this territory from the sale of any land heretofore given or which may after be given by Congress of the United States for school purposes shall constitute an irreducible fund, the interest accruing from which shall be annually divided among the school districts in the territory. So they're paying for free schools for Montana's uh, children when they arrived. The other thing that I thought was interesting was one of the amendments to the bill, and this was, again, this was one of those fortuitous, fortuitous events, because as I was getting ready to scan the front page of the bill, I was going through it, and it's a number of pages, and I got to the end, and there was this folded up piece of paper, it was tri-folded, and it was tucked in there, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. We don't typically do that in the archives. And so I took it out, and I flattened it out, and it was the amendments to the bill, and I thought it was interesting that Chapter 3, Section 6 amendment states that all teachers will be certified in order to teach in the state of, or in the territory of Montana. Even back then, they wanted their teachers to be certified by the county superintendent that they were of the correct character and had the uh, necessary skills uh, in, in order to teach the children of the territory. And like I said, Thompson and the Republican Party were huge advocates of public education and free public education um, for, uh, for, the, for the country. They saw it as a way to kind of democratize the, the population. Um, and so the haves and the have-nots would be going to the same type of school system. Another thing that Thompson got his hands on was the territorial seal. And uh, this is in actually in his collection of uh, his small collection of papers that we have in the Historical Society. And this is the original sketch that he made of what he thought and his committee members thought should be the seal of the territory of Montana. And if you look at it, it hasn't changed a great deal. It's color now. And some of the background uh, things are there, like the falls of the Missouri and the sun and so forth that Thompson just wrote in. But it's interesting that Thompson was tapped to do this. Evidently, he'd acquired a small skill for engraving brands or stamps for mining claims. And because he had this unique ability, they decided he was the perfect individual to define or to design the seal for the state of, uh, or for the, for, the, uh, for the territory of Montana. And I was speaking to one of my colleagues, and she pointed out that um, on this it says Aura L Plata, and on the current one it's Aura Y Plata. So for those of you who have a background in Spanish, you can explain to me why that's grammatically incorrect. Or we can move on. <laughs> the Y means and. The Y means and? What does the L mean? 
floral <laughs> okay. Well, and that was one of the, the controversies about the differences in the, in the spelling. Was the original spelling with the L um, some type of, of, of a nod to Latin as, a, as opposed to Spanish? And the Y was actually the Spanish version and the L was some type of Latin um, connecting word that, that, that put them together. There was that, that's something that they've debated over the years. Um, and now, Colonel Sanders, I, I hope you don't take offense at what I'm going to read next, but it's part of a speech that you gave at the dedication of the Capitol. And while they were all excited and willing to pass into legislation this, this beautiful seal for the territory of Montana, not everybody was happy with the motto, uh, gold and silver. And Colonel Sanders, you were one of those individuals who expressed um, maybe, maybe some slight disdain for the motto. Right. And uh, so this is, I'm, I'm going to read your own words, sir, so I, I do apologize. Uh, we have the highest respect for Judge F.M. Thompson, member of the council in the first legislative assembly of Montana, who conceived the design of the seal and motto. But it was evidently adopted with little consideration of the proprieties of the subject. The motto, Oro Y Plata, is in poor taste, and with a lapse of time, only becomes more conspicuously offensive to good taste and casts a reproach upon our people as if the jungle of gold and silver was the only music they could appreciate. And the acquisition of the minor and the transient features of our wealth, the highest if not the only object worth living for. When the motto for our seal was chosen, gold and silver were supposed to be the only metallic treasures Montana was known to possess. But subsequent years have shown how short-sighted those early settlers were. Perhaps some Indian tradition could furnish the clue to a suitable motto rather than have the present motto. I would much prefer to strike out the motto altogether. I made my point. You made your point. Yes, you did, sir. <laughs> I think it's interesting that over time, the motto, or uh, gold and silver, has kind of morphed into the treasure state. And the treasure state in itself implies something more than just gold from the ground and silver from the ground and copper. Um, we all know that Montana is, is a state of mind. It is a treasure state. We treasure it for its landscapes, the variety of its landscapes, for its sunrises, its sunsets. It's gold and silver. And for the presence of such individuals as Colonel Sanders, we, we treasure it for that as well. Um, Governor Toole also objected to the motto but his main objection was because it was Spanish. And we had just recently had fought a war with the Spanish, the Spanish-American War, and he just didn't think it was fitting that our flag should have Spanish on it. So there were more than one detractor for the motto. It stayed, however, as you can see, it's, it stood the test of time. Montana? Maybe we I could just, talk about I that I make another later. point. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the... Uh, things that Thompson, as I mentioned, uh, carried was the bill for the creation of the Historical Society. And he was very invested in making sure that the Historical Society was actually launched and didn't just end up something that was written down on paper. And we know this because in 1908, he wrote a letter to William S. Bell Esquire, who was the librarian of the Montana Historical Society at that time, um, kind of giving his recollections of... Uh, of uh, how that took place with the, uh, with the creation of the Historical Society. It goes, it gives me much pleasure to receive yours of the 28th Ultimo. Since the death of my old friend, Colonel Sanders, our condolences, sir, I have yeah. hardly heard from Montana. It is, difficult, it is a difficult thing to hark back over 40 years and bring to mind with any certainty transactions which took place so many years ago. But my recollection about the formation of the Historical Society of Montana is that I called together a few of my fellow members of the first legislature and proposed the matter to them. James Stewart, I'm sure, was quite interested in the matter and agreed to promote the affair in the lower house. It was left to me, to, it was left to me the charter, and I'm quite sure that Captain W.W. DeLacy had a hand in the matter, and Colonel Sanders gave his valuable assistance and advice as well. A day or two after the legislature adjourned, I went to Virginia City, where Mr. Sanders then was, and getting together as many of the corporators as possible, 
put out an informal meet. We had an informal meeting. We gave the notice required in the charter by publishing in the Post, and on February 25th, 1865, held a meeting for the purpose of organization. I was at that time making arrangements for leaving the territory, but was anxious to have the society in working order before I departed, and that much was accomplished. I think that for several years, but little if anything was done by the society, but when it did await to take up the work for which it was created, it soon took a prominent and very credible position among the antiquitarian antiquity, old, and historical societies in the country. <laughs> Note to self, don't put words in that you can't pronounce. <laughs> um, as Thompson mentioned, he was on his way back east. Uh, he and Sanders and Governor Edgerton had become involved in a number of financial dealings and had a number of, of mining claims and things like that that they wanted to divest themselves of. And um, so he was, he was getting ready to, to head out. Um, and in fact, he, he writes in another letter to, uh, to Bell that when I left the territory, Governor Edgerton appointed me Commissioner of Immigration for New York. I will in a few days send you a circular issued by me as Commissioner. I presume that it was aided, I presume that it aided somewhat in its inducing immigration, which was its object. And I love this quote from the bottom of it. For men who expect to work for success and for capitalists, there is no better place than Montana. But for bummers and loafers, it's the worst place in the world. I would refer the latter class to the report of the Vigilance Committee for encouragement and information. <laughs> <laughs> so even, even, uh, even, his, uh, even his serious promotions of Montana had a touch of humor to it. Um, and I, I love the way he, he writes at the end of this letter. Um, I presume that it aided somewhat in inducing immigration, which was the object. I am glad that my language was not more optimistic than it was. So he didn't oversell Montana in his opinion. Uh, Thompson had had a number of uh, communications with the Historical Society of Montana uh, before 1908. In 1899, the Helena Herald, um, published a obituary for former Montana pioneer Francis M. Thompson, who had passed away in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Uh, this prompted uh, Historical Society librarian Laura Howie to send a letter to the heirs of Thompson inquiring about the existence of any records of his early days in the territories. Imagine her surprise when Thompson wrote her back. <laughs> And again, it's, his sense of humor is just wonderful. Your kind letter addressed to the heirs of Francis M. Thompson, I received in person. <laughs> as long as Montana papers say nothing but good of me, it is rather interesting to read their obituary notices. But should the case be reversed, I should prefer that they let me continue my allotted time. <laughs> uh, the li librarians at the Historical Society were always on the hunt for historical records of the early pioneer days and so forth. And so Mrs. Howie, um, Mr. Bell carried on these correspondences with, with Francis Thompson asking him for his information, his memories of the creation of the territory and, and what it was like. It was at that time they found out that uh, he was in the process of, of uh, writing what would become a tenderfoot in Montana. Um, it was published in serial format in a magazine back east and then later uh, published in, in, as the as a, a tenderfoot in Montana. Um, and again, his sense of humor is just wonderful. Um, this was pointed out to me uh, be, uh, be just before the presentation uh, began this evening about an incident that occurred at a mining uh, claim uh, during, the, uh, during the session. One day, some miners at work on number four broke through into a cavern of considerable extent, which they asserted was of great beauty. When they had arranged their machinery so as to be able to lure people into their mine, they extended an invitation to the governor and the members of the legislature to visit the new discovery. We were all lured safely into the cavern, which was indeed a wonderful sight. While not of great size, the walls of the room and the stalactites suspended from the roof were beautiful, and the stalagmites in rare and picturesque form covered the floor of the cave. Before the crib containing the governor and some of the council was raised to the surface, the occupants were made to pledge themselves to pass a bill pending in the legislature what the miners were interested in, <laughs> which trick they considered a huge joke upon the members. 
So these were fairly raucous times in Montana, and Thompson enjoyed every moment of it. As I said, you can see his passion for the territory, for Montana, for the state, his interest of it shining through. I also love the statement that he makes in the letter, I have always hoped that I might sometime visit the great commonwealth, the mortar of whose foundations I helped to mix. And he probably would have, but he fell in love with a lady back east, and she just wouldn't move. So he came back, which was a good thing. Because as we know, and as Colonel Sanders said, no man ever came to Montana, spent such a brief time, and left such a lasting mark on our state than Francis Thompson. Thank you. Now we do have time for some questions of either myself or Colonel Sanders. I will remind you, though, that Colonel Sanders is due back in his box at 8 o'clock sharp. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have about a half an hour for questions and answers. And so, Colonel Sanders.